As we follow the stories of the Canadians who died in this plane crash, we also, of course, are watching the investigation. As we heard from the Prime Minister and as we're hearing from our guests this morning, so many Canadians have questions about what happened, what brought this plane down. And many of those questions remain unanswered. But we do have already a preliminary report from Iran's civil aviation organization. And to bring you some insight on what it says and to help us understand that better, we're bringing back on the program this morning, John Cox. You saw him yesterday, former pilot, the president of Safety Operating Systems, and he is also a member of the International Society of Air Safety Investigators. This morning, he's in Florida speaking with me. And John, it's good to see you again this morning on the program. Thank you for returning. Good morning, Heather. Thanks for having me back. Before I get to the, the meat of the report, it is a preliminary report, but we're getting it from this aviation authority sort of about 24 hours, even less than 24 hours after the crash occurred. Is that too fast? Can we rely on whatever information is in this? In the early days of any investigation, there's a lot of information that will, will change. So this is the information that they have um, as of today. Okay. But I think see some changes as, as it goes forward and the investigators learn more. All right. Well, based on what we have so far, I'm going to ask you some questions. Here's what we're hearing in the part of this preliminary report, that no radio messages were received from the pilot regarding unusual situations. So the pilot did not contact air traffic controllers. What does that tell you, John? Really not a lot because we know the airplane probably had some form of an electrical problem because the data it was transmitting uh, out, it suddenly stopped and that could indicate that the radios would also be affected. So first, they may not have been able to contact air traffic control. And secondly, a pilot's primary duties is to fly the airplane and to handle the emergency then and only then when you have time do you contact air traffic control. Air traffic control can't do anything really for you other than get other airplanes away from you. So contacting hmm. them immediately following a problem uh, is fairly far down the list. Okay, that's really interesting. So the pilot would not necessarily even have contacted air traffic control in any situation here. That's important to keep in mind. The report notes that the plane seemed to be trying to turn back for the airport um, when the plane went down. Seemed to be turning back. Again, in that, John, do you see anything of note? Well, it says that they, they recognized they had a problem. They knew that they could the closest airport was probably going to be Tehran. And so it would make good sense if they were trying to deal with a serious problem on board that they turn the airplane toward the airport. Okay. <laughs> Eyewitnesses, John, including a crew from another plane that was in the air at the same time, described seeing this uh, Ukraine International Flight 752 engulfed in flames. So it was burning when it went down. How do we understand that? That's one of the greatest questions we have so far, Heather, and that is, how do you get that much fire in an airplane in flight? It's very difficult to do and not have the airplane either disintegrate or the, for the fire to actually be blown out by the speed of the aircraft. So that is a very large question that the investigators are dealing with today and will be dealing with um, going forward is to understand the mm -hmm. origin of the fire and also the magnitude and where the airplane was burning. But it's very unusual to see this amount of fire on an airplane in flight. That's an important point that we'll think of then. If it turns out to have been, or I mean, immediately it was posited that this was a mechanical or engine failure, if that were the case, um, would it normally be in flames? I mean... I'm just, we talked yesterday about how this plane is designed to fly on one engine even if one engine is out. So if it wasn't an engine failure, would it necessarily and normally be on fire, I wonder? No, it would not. Uh, uh, even a, an uncontained engine failure, which is catastrophic, uh, typically will not cause a fire like this. So this is the back to the same question. What could cause a fire of this magnitude? 
is very, there are very few possibilities, but uh, an engine fire or an uncontained engine failure, I don't believe you would see this level of, uh, of a fire, this magnitude of a fire. I'm wondering, I'm thinking of the 176 people on that plane um, and what we're hearing, the plane turning back, fire outside, they would have had time to realize something catastrophic was going on, wouldn't they, John? Sounds like. It, it's hard to say because we don't know the, the level of, uh, of the event. Um, the thing that we do know, which is unusual, is that normally if you have a very catastrophic event, the airplane begins to break open, um, then basically the airplane disintegrates. That did not happen here. So why not? And then what was going on inside the cabin and who knew what? Uh, that's something the investigators will look at, but it's it's premature. We don't have enough evidence right now to draw any conclusions to that. Okay. The black boxes, we spoke yesterday that both have been recovered. What we're hearing in this preliminary report is that some of the memory has been lost and there has been some damage. How significant could that be to getting the overall picture? It's very early and I'm a little suspect of that statement because if someone looks at the recorders and sees damage and they assume that that will result in a loss in data, that may or may not actually be true. Until we get the device in the laboratory with the experts that get the memory chips out and download the, and they're protected in an armored environment. So the fact that someone who may not be an expert has said that there may be a data loss I think it's premature. I think until we get those the, those recorders in the laboratory, then and only then will we know what data is available. All right. Um, I listen to you and I hear you say premature and it's early. So we do have to have that caveat as we look at things. But based on this preliminary report from the Iran Civil Asia Aviation, uh, this does help us understand things better. And I thank you for it. I want to uh, conclude. I don't think you'll be able to see from where you are in Florida. But I'm going to bring up a picture for our viewers and I'm going to describe it to you, John. It's just been posted on Twitter by Aviation Iran. I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, it introduces itself as, as following the news from within the Iranian aviation industry. Industry. And it's a picture of a big round table. And the tweet says, according to Iran Civil Aviation Organization, the first joint meeting has commenced with the presence of Iranian and Ukrainian investigation teams. We know they've arrived in the country, as well as Ukraine International Airlines officials. And then as per ICAO Annex 13, it goes on to say Iran has invited Canadian and Swedish authorities. Now, what does that tell you? Because we, we yesterday at this very point in our conversation, we were saying that Iran is not going to give the black boxes to Boeing or to U.S. authorities. So, I mean, what does this suggest to you? The invitation to Canadian and Swedish authorities. Sweden lost four uh, civilians or citizens and Canada lost 63, of course. What do we um, interpret from that? I think that's a very positive step. The ICAO Annex 13 is the international protocol for accident investigation and for the Iranian authorities to embrace and agree to use that protocol as a major step forward. It also says that it is possible that they will uh, give the reporters to be read out to possibly the Canadians or the Swedish, either one of which are capable of doing that. The Canadian Transportation Safety Board is a one of the best in the world and I'm very hopeful that Iran will give those reporters to the Canadian authorities and let them read them out because I know they have the expertise to do it and do it well. So the fact that uh, they are following ICAO Annex 13 means that it should be a transparent and open investigation and that we will have answers to all of these many questions uh, in an appropriate time. Well, may that hope be borne out, John, because many in this country do have uh, questions and are hopeful for that information. The Transportation Safety Board has appointed someone already, we know, to handle just that information that you referred to, so they're ready to do that. We know our Foreign Affairs Minister is hoping to have conversations with his counterpart in Iran to get this information, and hopefully it is a hopeful sign as you interpret it for us this morning. A pleasure to have you back with us, John, and we'll speak again. I thank you for today. Thanks, Heather.
John Cox, who is the president of the Safety Operating Systems, a former pilot and a frequent aviation expert to whom we turn on this program.